All right, we're, we're going to get this started. Uh, this is a panel of Keystone experts that are going to talk about their experiences with Keystone, best and, uh, well, except for you, Jesse, uh, their experiences with public and private cloud. And so the first thing I'm going to do is quickly give them just a very brief amount of time to introduce themselves, their role, and uh, how they deploy Keystone. So the first person I'm going to look to is Matt Fisher from Time Warner. Matt, why don't you talk to us about uh, your role and how you deal with Keystone? I'm an engineer at Time Warner Cable. Um, I started working on Keystone because um, we needed someone to work on Keystone. It's not a lifelong passion for identity or anything like some of the guys. Um, but basically, uh, we run a private cloud for internal, um, internal use at Time Warner Cable for software projects, basically. Um, and we currently deploy Keystone in Docker containers and run it on top of uWSGI, but have gone through several iterations of that to get to that, get to, to get to that point. Okay. Please, Morgan. Monty, uh, if you could take the mic and uh, tell us your role with Keystone. Hello. Uh, so hi, my name is uh, Monty Taylor. Um, I deploy Keystone between 10 and 20,000 times a day because uh, I'm involved in running the OpenStack uh, infrastructure gating system. Uh, I also work for IBM where they have uh, strangely titled me Distinguished Engineer. I have no idea what that's all about. Um, and uh, I'm there involved with the, the public cloud deployment effort um, and I'm also uh, a consumer of, of Keystone um, in that I work on um, client library things to talk to OpenStack, including the Shade library and the Ansible modules uh, that use that. Uh, and also, weirdly, I'm a core on Keystone Auth, which clearly is a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> our, our next panelist is Jesse Keating from Blue Box, an IBM company. That's right. So yeah, I'm Jesse. We're we're still Blue Box for like the next couple of weeks, I think. So Congrats. Blue Box, comma an IBM company, um, soon to just be IBM. Uh, I am the OpenStack lead for our private cloud as a service product that uh, that Blue Box brought to the table. Uh, in in that product, we utilize Keystone. Um, so I don't install it as many times as Monty does, but we do install it quite a few times. Uh, we run many, 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 many small clouds uh, that have some very special needs that uh, Keystone helps and hinders us with. Um, so yeah. Excellent. Next we have Dolph Matthews from Rackspace. Hi. Um, I work in, I guess I've been working on Keystone for about five years. Uh, spent most of that time uh, working in the private cloud group at Rackspace. Uh, so I get poked and prodded and stabbed uh, with questions and problems from our support team all the time. Uh, and I've spent just a little bit of time in the public cloud side of the house, uh, which is now all under one big umbrella, so. Okay, next we have Steve Martinelli. He's Keystone PTL. Uh, yeah, as Brad said, I've been working on upstream development in Keystone for about three years now, maybe a little bit more. Uh, and I'm the current, and I was the Keystone project lead last release and for this release. So I'm here for more of uh, trying to defend Keystone from all the, uh, uh, shanking. the shanking that's going to go on between these guys. Good luck. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Excellent. So I do have a large number of questions, and I could easily keep us afloat here for a, an extended session of three to four minutes. But before I do that, um, you know, it had been advised to us that we really wanted to open it up first to questions from the audience, because um, we want to hear those questions first. I do have a list that we can go to if we need them. Um, so we do have microphones. And as motivation, we've got three free books. First, three people who ask a question, each person gets a book. And then for the rest of you, you can get them at the IBM booth. And they're signed. We, we will sign them after the session for you, sure. <laughs> you can get any, any, and some of these guys who didn't even author can sign it as well. Um, so please do not be shy. Um, you, you know, in all seriousness, seriousness, we have a lot of Keystone experts here, and this is the time. All right. Go ahead. Okay, want to take this one? But, um, oh, oh, maybe I can't. Might be on now. I think it's right now. Try it. Yeah. 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 So, nice. um, 
My question is less specific on Keystone and more specific on um, management of Keystone, I guess is the question I'd ask. So Keystone lets you define users somehow, right? And I don't really care how, whether it's a directory or you have them in the local database, and you define roles. But how are folks managing who gets into that? Who gets into those roles? Are you using an external identity management system? Um, is there some poor admin, you know, running on a wheel, just adding users as requests come in? Um, you know, or, or, or is there a need for an audit trail? Stuff like that. So I'll, I'll take this one. I think this answer is going to vary across uh, because we all are doing vastly different things with our clouds. So in, in our case at Bluebox, what we provide to our customer is the entire private cloud. Like our customer gets the whole thing um, and they get a certain level of administrative rights on it. They don't get full admin um, because we don't want them to do silly things like delete a compute service and page us in the middle of the night um, or create networks that loop each other and take down you know, parts of the data center. Uh, so they get some level of rights uh, and that does include the right to create uh, tenant projects uh, and users and assign them roles within Keystone. Um, we don't allow them to create like the admin role or assign the admin role to their users, but beyond that, we sort of wash our hands of it and say, it's your cloud, dude, do what you want. Um, some of our customers are, do want to back it by an LDAP uh, and have us assign that to a, a domain for them, um, in which case you know, that's all managed by them. Uh, the vast majority of our customers, though, are doing whatever it is that they need to do to stuff the users that they want into the localized Keystone database. So, so you're, you're saying that it's more ad hoc, uh, they're, they're, you're not running into customers trying to use like a Oracle Identity Manager or, uh, or something to that effect to try and manage who has the access. It's more admins pushing users into roles rather than some kind of uh, uh, automated process. Right, we guide them. A lot of ours are first time cloud users and so we guide them on, on what to do. Um, and our product hasn't necessarily had the feature set that would allow for some of the, the deeper integrations. But that has been a request from many of our customers to, as we grow into the enterprise space, to be able to tie into their existing identity. Um, and the, the direction we're going with that is you know, slap an open ID exposure on your identity service. We'll tie into that through federation and off you go. Um, but the point being that they manage that side and we just manage the trust and beyond that. Yeah, I'll, uh, so I was, I was, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, the the way that I, the the model that I like. So one of, one of my roles is that I I go and I beat up on all the public clouds that are that are out there. And there's a there's a bunch of different models that people provide me as a as a user and consumer. Um, and and the the model that I like the most for this uh, is is similar to um, uh, similar to what what Jesse was just talking about. Uh, which is that as a as a customer of a cloud, um, what I what I want to get is I want to get a domain admin account, um, and then I want to be able to create as many users and projects and map those users to roles as possible. Um, then personally, the way that I do that um, is to manage those users and roles and projects uh, using uh, using Ansible. Uh, that might have something to do with the fact that uh, Shrews here and I. Uh, are the maintainers of all of the Ansible <laughs> modules to, to manage open that clouds. Um, so I'm going to probably use those, but, but being able to have a playbook for my, for my cloud that says, I want, you know, I want these users and these projects and I want these users to have these roles in these projects is, is really useful in, in my particular case in, in this, uh, you know, if I have that domain admin uh, ability, um, to, to do that rather than it being about me managing, uh, for all of the users, say in my in my organization uh, at work or something like that, each of these are, are more likely uh, uh, project specific. Um, so like, here's here's my here's the project I'm creating in Keystone that I'm going to stick my control plane services in. Here's the project that I'm going to stick sort of this dynamic pool of nodes in. Here's the the project where I'm going to stick my mirrors, like things where I want to make sure that there's some some service level privilege separation. Um, but it's actually. I'm the human that's actually ap operating all of those all of those users and roles. So there's a um, uh, uh, it's not exactly the thing, but yeah, that's the that's sort of my my thing on it. Okay. Anyone else want that? I'll go. Oh, go ahead. Um, ours is similar to Jesse's, um, except I think you're doing yours for separate companies, right? Yeah. So ours is separate project teams. So one project team might be running a website, and the other project team might be um, doing some kind of support function, and so. 
originally when we started and it was, you know, no one's really using it, we just tell people just file a ticket with us and we'll, we'll make you an account. Um, and that didn't scale very well because uh, the first thing we found out is they got an account and then they would say, well, now what am I supposed to do? So then we wrote a bunch of tooling to make them an account, a project, a router, a network, um, you know, just like basic bootstrap. Um, and then that didn't even scale well because as soon as someone found out they liked it, the whole rest of his team wanted an account too. And we were doing a lot of Jira tickets. So we um, introduced a concept, um, I think it's called a project owner. So the tech lead on your team might be granted project owner and uh, it's a special role and we have special code in Horizon actually so that um, if we have a new team member join that team, um, they don't have to talk to us, they need to talk to someone on their team and say, hey, add me in here, give me an account, and then that person gets a limited ability to control what that person can do. Uh, for example, we control who can use our LBAS service. Um, or we, we want to know who can use it. So by default, you can't, but if your tech lead on your team says, yes, you can use that or you can use Heat, um, they deal with it themselves, and they don't call us, and they don't file tickets. Uh, it's way, way more scalable, but those are all sort of, it's basically custom horizon code. Um, that handles that. And we still have all the bootstrapping stuff in place for, um, for times when we need it, but we've tried to outsource that away from us. Um, doesn't make sense to have a ticketing system involved in getting started with OpenStack. You're good? Okay, cool, thank you. Come up and get your book. Okay. <laughs> we'll just recycle it. <laughs> Next question. Oh, it's this chap over here. Go ahead. Oh. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Krishna, I work for Cisco, and uh, thank you so much for your contributions. Uh, it's been useful in every day of my life with Keystone. Um, I have questions uh, specifically on federation. Um, I have been uh, trying out uh, uh, federation ephemeral user-based authentication, and I have been successful in that. Um, I have three, four questions on that. The first one is, uh, when is the CLI-based support? for um, um, ephemeral, ephemeral users are gonna come. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so the CLI support for Federation is tricky because they are primarily browser-based. Um, it does exist in some fashion. Um, it's just the, specifically the problem lies on uh, OpenStack client needs to migrate right. off of the Keystone client code and start using the Keystone auth library now. Once that happens, which is targeted in just a few weeks, we have prototypes of it, but um, once that happens, it should, uh, there are plugins for both OpenID Connect and SAML and ADFS, um, and uh, you just have to configure your, uh, your identity provider to um, expose certain features that'll allow, uh, that'll allow for the redirect to happen. Sometime in Newton or? What was that? Sometime Newton, if you want to know if it's Newton time frame. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, cool. Uh, second question is, why groups in the mapping instead of direct projects? I mean, if you needed a group to map the identity provider, you could have a group and That's then dumb. I can directly map the projects. Uh, thank you, because I was so happy that someone would ask a question that Dolph would have to answer. So <laughs> thank you. That's a book, that's a book. Yeah, that was basically, uh, technical design limitation that we dealt with. Um, so shadow users, uh, which we implemented uh, over the past release and we'll continue to work on in Newton, uh, will totally alleviate that. Um, so I told kind of level set everyone, uh, if you set up a identity provider today uh, and are federating users into Keystone, um, the only way you can assign them authorization is to map them into groups and you do all your authorization management on the groups, not on the users themselves. Uh, so the way we're changing that in past release, the next release, uh, is we're going to be shadowing all of your federated users into the local uh, identity database uh, so they can treat all users exactly the same. They're all effectively local users. It's just a matter of where you authenticated to get into the cloud in the first place. Uh, so you'll be able to assign roles directly to federated users, uh, put users into arbitrary groups after they've already uh, started using the cloud and so on. So, changing. Would that help with auditing in any way, having the shadow identities or? That's actually something I wanna talk about at the summit. <laughs> Excellent. Well, well, we'll all wait with bated breath then. Okay. Um, this, 
Uh, I might have probably regarding the groups might have bumped into a bug. Basically, is uh, if you have multiple groups, um, it works through the Keystone uh, Manage by actually checking the mapping. But when I do the actual federation, uh, the list of the groups, um, the, the Unicode U, it's actually it, it, it becomes a part of the list. So when I, when uh, when uh, when it tries to iterate through the groups. It gets both the groups or multiple groups together, and that uh, that's a, maybe I can show you that off uh, after sure. this thing. Yeah. File a bug. <laughs> I did. I did actually file okay. a bug on that. Okay. Uh, my last some. question is why Steve is hasn't triaged it yet. <laughs> why SSO redirect HTML at the last stage to to give the unscope token back? Is it uh, is, isn't there a better way to do that? Or can you repeat the question one more time? During the federation flow. The last stage, you have an HTML file which actually puts the unscoped token to give it back to Horizon. Why is that? Uh, uh, that was really the only way we could get it to work between Keystone and Horizon. And uh, that's what the CERN guys were using as a workaround. Um, is in that their secure? That's, that's probably my question. <laughs> is it secure? Yeah. <laughs> They're all bearer tokens. Um, it is just the ID. It is a bearer token. Um, it is a. Like the fact that it's HTML will make it less secure. Yeah. No. Okay. Way, all right. Perfect. That's all. That's all I had. Okay. Now, have you already gotten a book? Yeah. I did. Okay. <laughs> See, I knew we were going to need three. Oh, okay. It'd be our pleasure afterwards. Okay. Um, do we have another? Yeah, sure. So it's on Federation again. Sure. I'd maybe like to get the view of the, the operators, how they see deploying uh, federated keystone at scale, perhaps. If there's any sort of, do they have any experience of that or plans to do that? Uh, so we're not at scale. Um, what is at scale is my bar tab from trying to implement Federation. Um, <laughs> It's a bit rough to get all the pieces together. So in particular, our method of operation is to automate everything. If we can't put it in an Ansible playbook, we don't put it in the product. Um, and trying to automate the dance that has to happen with Federation is difficult. Um, we started and managed to be part of the demo f at uh, Vancouver for a Keystone to Keystone Federation, where we just acted as a, a consumer from somebody else's identity. And that was pretty handcrafted um, to make the demo work. And we scrapped the, the adding it to the product, partly because a lot of the user land tooling wasn't ready yet. Um, it was raw HTTP calls that we're throwing at curl um, to get things set up. Uh, the landscape is better now, um, and that's why we're looking at it again. But it is still quite a lot of moving parts to try and automate in a thing that we can just stamp out over and over and over again. Um, provided the right input from the particular client. So I, I don't have much of a better answer uh, for you than that, uh, uh, except that in, in, in six months, uh, we should have a, a, a much more detailed answer there. The, um, the, the uh, IBM's public open stack uh, that, we're, that we're in the process of sort of rolling out and, and getting up um, is, uh, is going to be both at scale and using federated identity. So the, there's a team working on that literally right now. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't have a, a great sort of succinct answer for, for how that's working out. But in, in six months, uh, if, you, if you join us in Barcelona, um, uh, or, or in 12 months, uh, if, you, <laughs> if you don't want to go to Barcelona in six months, which is a mistake, they have lovely food in Barcelona. Uh, but in 12 months in, in Boston, um, uh, uh, there should be some, some really good feedback from, uh, from, from that at, at scale and, and, some, and some lessons learned from that. OK. Hold on. I can totally add to that. Uh, so one of the problems that uh, you're going to run into trying to operate, uh, say, a lot of identity providers at scale, like I'm assuming that's what you mean by scale, uh, is actually managing those. Uh, currently, we assume that you are going to use Shibboleth, because that's kind of our recommended, the fastest path to federation that we had. Um, if you're doing that, and say you're doing that in a pub public cloud or something, uh, that means you're bouncing all your keystone nodes every time you need to like manage IDPs and certs and things, uh, change shibboleth configuration, and that's obviously a no-go. Mm -hmm. um, 
So one of the things we're prototyping right now, there's a spec that was originally put out uh, around the Tokyo summit um, is to kind of re-implement Shibboleth and get it all into Python uh, so that we can do everything through the API. Um, so that dance that you're doing right now, uh, hopefully we can ease that and make it all pure HTTP. So yeah, no more bouncing. Nice. That's Did great. You, Thank you. Do you, oh. We have a taker, yay. You have made my day. <laughs> that and if I only had a chair. Um, who is our next? Anyone else? There's somebody at the mic. Yep, me. Uh, Go ahead. So uh, <clears throat> as public cloud operators, do you guys see a need uh, for having, I guess, headless users, like API users or kind of what Amazon has with their oh. instance users? Because, uh, I mean, it just doesn't really make sense for some automation and scripts to have uh, users that are associated to a human being uh, do some automation. Maybe you'd want to restrict the, credit, the the roles that those users have or something, right? To do just fetch stuff from Swift or something or those kind of restricted headless users purely for automation. Yeah, so I 100% I, I agree with you. Uh, I think that all of the public clouds that are out there, um, uh, regardless of their intent, should absolutely uh, give you, um, as the customer, um, the ability to have one or more users, right? And, and then you can, you can manage what you want to, to do with those, right? I think that's like for, in fact, for the applications that I run in, in, in the public clouds that I'm consuming right now, um, in a couple of them, I have the ability to, to create the headless users that I need. And in some of them, I have to go and create multiple separate accounts, each with their own credit card and everything like that, which is ridiculous, right? Like that's, that's absurd uh, and, and shouldn't be the case, but it's, Many of those public clouds have been around since before there was really good support in, in Houston. So I'm not really picking on them. It's just the, it's the state of, of, a, of a growing and fast moving project. But that is definitely the shape of it. There's also a session tomorrow, I think it is, the instance user session. It's after this. It's, it's after this, great. Yeah. Um, I think those are also a really, so I've, I've in, in fact experienced that exact problem. Uh, we have uh, in, in the open, in OpenStack's build infrastructure, uh, we, we at the end of, of jobs, um, uh, tr currently, well, some of our, our build logs go to just a file server, but we've been migrating to, to uploading them to Swift. But that means that those, um, those, those build logs that we're running on ephemeral nodes uh, need to be able to um, authenticate to Swift to upload the logs. Obviously, I do not want to give my credentials to, um, to ephemeral things that are running code that somebody submitted over the internet uh, into a code review system, uh, the credentials to delete all of my servers. Uh, that would be really terrible, but that is, that is one of the only choices that I've got, other than there's, you can use Swift uh, you know, temp URL uh, middleware stuff, and that gets really strange. So 100% yes, that is what everybody should be doing, and we just have to go beat them all over the head until they do that. So I, oh, I'll go first. So um, private cloud is the exact same use case uh, because our users actually primarily authenticate with their LDAP username and password, um, which is uh, also controls like where your paycheck goes. So um, when you tell them, um, we have some users that say, hey, I want to use Jenkins to do something really cool, but I don't like my employee ID um, and password in there. So we'll create what we call service accounts, and um, it actually works great for the users. We don't do any role restriction, really. Um, but the downside is then when the security guys say, okay, we have these audit logs, but who is this user? What person is behind this? And then it's kind of a complicated question. So we've tried to tie it back to the project owner, which I mentioned before. Um, and then we also have the same problems with uh, enforcing like password rotation policies, which LDAP does for us, but MySQL doesn't. And if you want your MySQL service user password to be one, two, three, four, five, there's nothing that's Nothing currently to stop you from doing that. So it's, it's caused some security challenges that we haven't quite figured out, but it's definitely something we use all the time. Well, it seems like the instance users is the solution to that, that part anyway, right? Well, partially. It depends on what you're meaning by instance <coughs> users and whether or not they're just short-lived for the moment and then blown away. The AWS way, whereas you know, you, when yeah. you create your instance, you basically say, I want to create a user associated to this instance which has these rights and it lives on the instance and that's it. Right. But those, those are, but that's, that, that is a thing, but you've got to be able to create that instance in the, in the first place. And so you've mm -hmm. sort of got a chicken, so if it's only instance users, like in, in my case, I'm, I'm 
externally to the cloud running automation that mm -hmm. is creating and deleting instances. So I've got to have something that is the user that's doing that. Mm -hmm. And that, I don't want that to be me, the human. I want that to be the automation role. And I probably right. don't want to put my billing account, credit card, password stuff into the, into the, into the we, Jenkins. We right. the don't put any passwords into Jenkins. <laughs> um, and we also have, you might lead the company. Yeah. And that's running all your CI for your team. Yeah. So what do we do? That's right. um, we if can't. it's tied to your LDAP ID, no one knows your password, and that ID is not going to work yeah. anymore anyway. So, so um, I don't think instance user solves the complete problem for not me. Not necessarily. It's no. an awesome you, you can't have it tied to human users, clearly. So this, there's got to be something that we can... The, the flip side to that also is that the services themselves need to support some, some concept of, okay, you are a user that exists, but you don't have rights. And in one of the previous design sessions, it was apparent that a lot of the services just use the, are you part of a, do you exist in this project? And that automatically gives you some level of right access. So the concept of read only doesn't really exist or read only in some projects and write to a specific. So in Monty's case, he's gonna want read only for everything except for Swift. Mm -hmm. And for Swift, you wanna be able to do that thing. And that doesn't exist in well, the, that, the policies that the services have right now, but that's a thing that we're trying to fix. But that brings us back to, I was just at the previous session where Adam Young was saying that, yeah, he once had a proposal for dynamic policy creation, right? Um, that would be managed by Keystone or whatever. But point is you could dynamically create policy that would be stored in the DB. Um, and that was rejected by the operators, apparently. But what I'm hearing this summit is a lot of operators saying, well, we need a way to create dynamic policy, right? I mean, you guys are saying it, other people were saying it. Yes and no, it's not, but not so much dynamic policy that exists in the database. Um, it's more of discoverable policy in, in um, reasonable defaults for that policy that you can override the small amount and see what changes over time, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and the flexibility in being able to outside of changing the code of the, of the software, make policy changes in how a consumer consumes the cloud. And make like, it easier to maintain. And make it easier to maintain, and also to make it discoverable so that I don't have one copy of my Nova policy with Nova, and another copy of my Nova policy with Horizon, and drift happening, causing very odd things. Um, okay, I also but, want policy management, sorry. Yeah, I also want, well, so I, I think that, that um, the people that wrote the original policy stuff should be shot in the face. Um, but uh, uh, it's just a terrible idea in the first place. But um, uh, it wasn't you. Yeah, uh, I didn't know who it was. It was, it was what? No, it was. <laughs> um, but, uh, but in any case, um, uh, the thing that I think that we're missing that's related to that is, so we have policy and we have roles, and those are the hammers that we're using to hit everything. And the thing that we don't have is we don't have ACLs, right? We don't have a way, so like if you go to, to GCE, right, and you, and you create a, like to create an instance uh, and create an instance user for, for that, um, you, you like you do with other things in, in any of those web services, you say this user can create this, not create this, you know, do this other thing, and there's like 12 or 14 different things that you can give different ACL things for, and we just don't have that concept at all. Right? We, have, we have roles that are defined in a policy file. You can get a list of roles. You have no idea what, what those do. roles yeah. can do, yeah. uh, and you can assign those roles to users. So that's hence the discoverability part. Exactly, yeah. Right. So at least if we can get discoverability of what sort does of what this predefined right. role do, yeah. that'd be neat. But if we, could, if we could have ad hoc, rather than just roles, if we could have ad hoc ACLs, I'd be a really happy person, but then these guys might want to kill me for making their lives harder. So I don't know. You know. No. <laughs> we just want policy around creating the ACLs. Yeah. Well, you want policy to, for creating the policy? Yeah. Oh, that'd be great, yeah. Can we have roles for who can create the policy <laughs> to create the roles so that your roles can create policy? Who gets admin access for that? You. <laughs> and uh, another problem that I see, and maybe I'm wrong here, maybe it's just something I'm not grasping correctly, but you know you have the other per domain um, backend in Keystone, right? So I create domain whatever, and let's say I, I have um, ADFS uh, federation set up with that, right? So I'm authenticating my human users against my IDP, which I should be doing, right? It's the right thing to do. Um, but then, let's say I did want to create service users for the non-human tasks. Um, do I have to create them in AD, right? Which is, you know, which is a no-go for us, at least in my company, right? So is there a way to have a kind of a split? Yeah. I, I know we could have different backends, but only for different domains. What if I want to have a different backend within the same domain? Ooh. Oh. And maybe there's a way that maybe maybe I'm hallucinating. Adam, maybe it's that, not a problem. But hopefully Adam's not here because he hates this. Um, 
we did ours before, uh, I don't think domains were a thing back then, um, but we basically have a driver that talks to LDAP and the MySQL. Yep. Yeah, it's we forked it from Suse's driver a long time ago, and uh, I think eventually we should probably switch to using domains. But I haven't really seen a clear path, and what we have kind of works. So, service accounts are in MySQL, and employee accounts are in um, LDAP AD. That's, that's just not a thing that we already have. I don't think so. Adam wants to. Yes, the Keystone guys don't really like it, but it does solve our problem. Congratulations, you, you have brought me the thing that, that brings me despair and unhappiness in this session. There's always gonna be at least one thing that makes me less happy about the world uh, in, every, in every session, so. And that's worth a book, if you don't have one. I, I have the book, I have the book. All right. <laughs> Thank you guys. Uh, we have any other questions? Uh, I have a question. Please. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is about role assignment. So right now the role assignment, uh, you need to specify a target. So say group, um, a role, and a target. And the target has to be a project or a domain. And it makes sense for a project level admin. But if I want something like a, like a global admin who can, who can manage domains and, and control, uh, you, know, you know what I mean. So, uh, and, and you cannot have an assignment of that sort. And, and I know that there is this uh, way you can configure uh, your policy file so that you can specify that, you know, uh, specify your admin to a particular domain or project and, and give them all the powers in the world. But, but that seems more like a workaround than the right way to do it. So uh, has, all, all, has this concept already been discussed and uh, thought about? Uh, yeah, there was a session um, just in the other building where there's an open spec for trying to define the idea of a global admin type role. Um, and it's, it's actually you guys probably can talk about this more than I can, right? The, the is admin role, yeah. So and, very and, long-running conversation, but yeah, and and uh, uh, there's an additional problem of uh, a lot of hard-coded code all over a different OpenStack project, which checks for is admin, uh, and and that is not actually controlled by the policy JSON file. And the is admin check comes from the is admin context rule that is set in the policy JSON file. So that would mean that uh, your RBAC does not completely come from policy JSON file, and then you would have to actually go and fix all those projects to get the actual multi-tenancy concept working. Yes, uh, the second question is a consequence of the first. Uh, I, we all, I think, agree that we need a higher level admin and a really good definition of it for like global root access across your cloud, and then we need domain level admins below that. Uh, we've tackled that a couple different ways. We don't have a crazy elegant solution. So it's an ongoing conversation. There are other sessions about it, and we have at least a session about that at every summit, it feels like. Yeah. So. Yeah, just to further that, it's, it's a huge thorn in our side, and it's a huge part of that is just because it's backward, we have to be backwards compatible. Um, and I agree the is admin uh, check is probably the worst thing in my opinion. Um, and we do have to go in and fix the individual projects. I don't know if it's we have to do that, but it's someone has to projects. fix them, yeah. yeah. There's a cross project effort around this. And what we sort of went forward with is identifying in all of the things that use policy to file the bugs against the, the direct in the code check for admin. Like that's step one, stop doing that. Um, use policy files instead. And step two is to implement the, the, the defining a project within your cloud that is the admin project. And if you exist in the admin project, you gain global view of things. Whether it's global admin or global observer or global member, you get just some, that's your trigger for being global. Um, and then that's a feature flag that either, yes, you support this, or no, you don't support this. So your policy either works as it is today if you don't support it, or it breaks 
if you don't change it, if you do support it, but there's a way to carry that forward between two releases so that you can do the right deprecation cycle. Um, so there, there's, the path forward is becoming clearer, at least from me as an operator point of view, whether or not the code can be written to match the path is, a, is the deeper question. Okay, and the second question, uh, I think it's, it has been discussed many times, but uh, I would still want to raise it. Uh, this is about being able to customize the policy JSON files. So uh, right now using the REST API, you can just go ahead and create a new role, but then what do you make out of that role? Uh, you would still have to say, let's say um, on a particular OpenStack installation, you're running five or six OpenStack uh, projects, you would have to open each of the policy JSON file and manually edit each of the rules to actually give any value to the role and then restart all the services. Uh, it, it doesn't seem like a real way to do it. Um, it, it kind of doesn't make sense at all. Uh, and that's one thing which customers always ask. I mean, okay, how do we customize it? And, and there's no real way to customize it other than giving more granular control by creating many number of roles, which ultimately gets really complex. Yes, uh, everyone's kind of mumbling that you don't actually have to restart services when you change their policy files. Uh, they're read on every request, I believe. Yeah. Um, so you can just change them. But yes, you totally have to go customize all your policy. Uh, the session we had earlier today, um, one of the driving goals uh, was to resolve that operator complaint, uh, which really came up at the Tokyo Summit. Uh, basically, every operator um, is customizing policy to some extent and shares your pain. Uh, and so we want to get what the community perceives as like, here's the conventional rules that we're all using anyway. Get those into all of the services policy files so that you're not having to customize so much. Uh, and the second half of your pain that you d didn't really describe is like, okay, then you go to upgrade OpenStack and you've got to resolve the conflict of migrating all of your changes that you customized in the last release of OpenStack and then applying those very security sensitive changes on top of new policy files from the new release. Uh, that's a really delicate process. Um, so hopefully we can resolve both of those things uh, over the next release. And uh, one more question is, uh, there are still a lot of projects which does not use uh, the policy engine at all. So for example, Swift does not have support for the policy engine. And uh, all it does is in the conf file, you can just specify the roles uh, so it's just a role, you can just control it based on role. So uh, that sounds kind of weird that, uh, you know, everything is not consistent and you don't really have our back control on a uh, popular OpenStack project like Swift. Yeah, so um, it would be really great if you'd give the Swift team the feedback that it would be important for them to do the same things as everybody else in OpenStack because they take the point of view that nobody cares. Uh, and that it is not important for them to uh, conform to the rest of uh, things like that. Um, uh, and so, to to their credit, they they usually claim that none of their users request it. So on the one hand, I'm being snarky and negative, and that's that's in poor form uh, on my side. Um, but on the other side, I'm, I'm being I'm being quite honest. Um, I, I believe that it, that they they do seem the, the Swift team cares very deeply about their their users. Um, the Swift users, not necessarily the OpenStack users. Um, and so m the more feedback Swift users can give the Swift team that this is pain for them, I, I believe is actually the, the feedback that, they're, that, they're, that they need, like they're waiting for people to, to tell them that it is important, right? Um, uh, because they're also trying to balance their long time users. They have users that were there before, you know, Open, OpenStack was even a, a thing. So uh, users outside of OpenStack and and, and very large installations that predate some of these shared services. So there's a, there is a, a, a cost, an opportunity cost there uh, for them. So, so more communication uh, to, the, to the Swift folks, I think, is the way to help that. Yeah, I think um, it would always be something that's optional. If it did support uh, Keystone's policy um, or the OSL policy, it would always be something that's optional for Swift because I can't see them not supporting their longtime users, so whether it's and it would probably be off by default, I, I imagine, because again, backward, uh, backward compatibility and all that. Yeah, 
And, and if I could just add a little bit to that, um, I believe Mike Perez, who works for the foundation, is looking at things that are cross-project consistency type items, and I think we ought to try and feed that back to Mike. It might be another one for him to track. And just like a theme on that point, uh, speaking as both someone who works on an auth project uh, and someone who in other lines of work like consumes auth. Uh, if you have a business case that you're trying to solve and it doesn't have anything to do with auth, then you don't care about auth. Uh, you go solve the problem you're trying to solve and auth is a solved problem checkbox. Is admin true? Don't care. Uh, so that actually explains like a lot of the historical precedents and like laziness uh, around how auth is consumed across, not just OpenStack, but like in software period. Uh, and that's just a reality of auth, so. Um, just one more point. It should be only Swift that doesn't use the policy. If, if it's not, if there's another project that's not Swift that is not using the policy checker or the engine, then let us know because. Does uh, Swift have some special privileges? <laughs> Would you like right. your book? <laughs> <laughs> I got one from the What's last that? release. So, yeah, no, yeah. so six years ago, uh, OpenStack started um, by taking some folks at NASA who had written Nova and some folks at Rackspace who had written Swift uh, and smushing them together into a thing that we then called OpenStack. So most of the rest of OpenStack has uh, basically as its parent lineage the things in Nova. Um, and the Swift team had a running production service that was not, uh, that did not do things the way that the, that the Nova stuff did. Um, and again, it's, it's really easy to, to sort of get into sort of a, a snarky and eye rolly place, but they have a very good point. They had a production service running while, while we were still doing the, the very early uh, iterations on all of the rest of the services, right? And so as we were building out the thing that we all think of as, as OpenStack right now, they were, they were running in production a very large cluster. Um, and so as we were getting this stuff going, um, you know, they were like, well, uh, um, uh, no, we're in production, right? Um, and that's, that's admirable. Like that's, that's, that's them actually really, really caring about their users and, and really doing a good job of that. It, 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 is, it is an unfortunate artifact of, of the way that that worked that, um, that we, we continually have to say things like, oh yeah, and also Swift, right? And, and that, that frustrates them too. Like they, don't, they, don't like, they don't like it when, when, when we have to say that, but there's some, there's some good, there are good historical reasons um, it, it's always frustrating when, when the answer to why is something different, well, six years ago we were all in a room and 20 of us blah, 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 and you're like, oh my gosh, that doesn't really help my problem, right? But, but there, there's, some, there's some real non-trivial differences that, um, that the, the cost of solving them um, hasn't, hasn't really been outweighed by the, by the pain of the divergence. Um, and and so, so it's, it's one of those things uh, that sort of persists to, to this day. Um, and you know, uh, and, and it's probably only like it, it's not going to get any easier because there are now a bazillion really big Swift installations out there. It's a really good product, right? And so, so as we as we talk, and we have very very you know very honest, frank, and and, and deep conversations about these things. I'm like, okay, well, that's interesting. This this thing you've got here, but how do we roll that out to our billions of 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 you know? of you know, massive you know, uh, Swift clusters and, and we're gonna have a good answer for that, right? So until we do have a good answer for, for how they deal with that, then, then that divergence, that, that historically uh, uh, based divergence is, it, is gonna continue until we, until we have a good story that doesn't involve uh, pain for their operators or users. So I'm, you know, on the one hand, I can I can be snarky beer. You know, let's go have a beer and I'll I'll rant. But like it's it's actually all very much stemmed in in a a, a very strong caring about uh, a, a, about their operators and, and their users that I, I think that that is um, uh, uh, very uh, important. Excellent. And I think we are out of time. We're a little bit over. Wasn't that awesome? That was awesome. So thank you all for coming and the great participation, and we really enjoyed the questions. All right. And if you needed a book, we've got two. <laughs>